welcome everyone uh, to uh, today's Innovation X Roundtable. Uh, today's topic is the future of work. Um, all of these roundtables are centered around the idea of innovation that matters. Uh, we are hosting this from uh, UC Berkeley's Targe Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. I'm Iqlaq Sidhu. I'm the director of the center and chief scientist. And uh, the prelude to this is that a lot has been changing in the world. Um, I don't think there, certainly in my lifetime, but I don't know how many uh, generations or, or uh, centuries you have to go back before you had as much change as, as we've had in this particular year. Uh, a lot has been happening in health conditions, uh, in the economy, in how we consume, and definitely how we work. And, I, and to some degree, some of this shift of how people have worked was already happening. And uh, COVID and the pandemic, uh, in some ways, it's brought some new things to that shift. And in other ways, it's accelerated things that might have even been happening before this time. Uh, now, uh, we're hosting this roundtable uh, not only to talk about these issues of how the world is changing in, ter in terms of um, the future of work, but also uh, as a, uh, I like to think, a mini advisory board meeting that is intended to give information back to Berkeley. And in particular, we're interested in not only how is the world changing, but you know what should Berkeley and the Satarjus Center do to best engage in this topic? Who should we be collaborating with? How do we work with other academic partners? How do we work with other industry partners? All of these um, dynamics, uh, you know, and, and also, you know, what can students be doing? So on behalf of really the whole Berkeley ecosystem, how do we engage with what's happening? With the future of work. Uh, in order to let everyone have a, a better chance at advising us, I'm going to share one slide. Um, I need to be able to share that one slide, uh, but <clears throat> um, I'm going to share one slide on uh, what, you know, what are the activities of the center, and if you can use that to um, have enough context to give us that information. Uh, let's see, Ken here. You should be able to now, Isaac. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and that is working. So momentarily, you're gonna see a slide here. All right, I'm not even gonna put this into um, presentation mode. Like you can kind of look at it in, in this um, version. Maybe I'll get rid of this ribbon here. Um, at, mostly because usually when you present put it in presentation mode, you never actually know what's going to happen. So um, I'm going to just switch to this one slide to explain to everyone, panelists and audience included, what does the Sitarja Center do? So first of all, the goal is to empower innovators to change the world, in particular to change the world positively. We do that with three buckets of, you know, three categories or pillars, however you want to think about it. One category is that we have um, a number of courses that are under the category of Berkeley Method of Entrepreneurship. They are about the, about, they're about um, uh, making entrepreneurs, basically making ventures and making entrepreneurs. But one thing that we're doing is we're really focusing on the psychological aspects like developing the mindset and the behavior uh, that's necessary. So we're developing the person and not only the venture idea. So all of that is in this category and there's a lot of challenge-based education that's going on there. The second category is what we're doing uh, with the innovation engineering topic overall. And that is through a lot of X labs that we have. We have them in data, in blockchain, plant-based meat, uh, we have one that we just ran, started last semester on 5G and AI. And these are a little closer to implementation. They, uh, they usually convene players like um, companies around the world or all the phone companies, for example, in the 5G AI space. And um, half of it is on what is the future, the story, and the other half is on building it. Okay, and, and so there's lots of implementation that happens there. 
And the third bucket, uh, third category, is what we do with professional and global education and engagement overall with the rest of the world. We have 15 global partners that uh, work with us on education and, and so forth. We also have a flagship program called Engineering Leadership Professional Program. Uh, in that program, uh, we have people from Apple, Google, Yahoo, Network Appliances, Samsung, Cisco. They're typically um, uh, mid-level, uh, um, director level or even vice president level people who are getting assigned broader levels of responsibility. And they're, they're engineering people that would not otherwise do an MBA, go to an MBA. So in a different format, they're um, broadening their capabilities. Anyway, it's an example of one of our, our um, professional and global education projects. Uh, with that, I think you basically understand what the center is. We do use these terms once in a while, innovation collider, mixing all kinds of people together. I'm going to stop this share. I think um, with that slide or that slide and a half, you have enough understanding of the components of the center. Uh, it's really my pleasure to kind of let you start this start off here. Uh, I'm going to hand it to Stacy Lawson, uh, who um, is uh, uh, I'm going to say to me, most importantly, founder, like co-founder of this very center, uh, going back, you know, 15 years now. But uh, but I think from her point of view, she probably has other titles that she would like you to be aware of as well. So she's the executive vice chairman at Y Green Energy Fund, and uh, she has a long list of entrepreneurial venture experiences and is on many boards. Um, and so with that whole combination, I'm going to hand it over to Stacy, uh, who will then um, introduce everyone else and we'll start the session. All right, thank you. Thank you, McLock, and welcome to everyone. Um, appreciate that introduction, McLock. I, I guess probably also to say I've spent my career at the intersection of, of entrepreneurship, sustainability, technology. Uh, one of those past um, roles in the technology space was as a business unit head for Siebel Systems in a unit called Employee Relationship Management, which was around uh, supporting employee performance and workforce overall. So this is an interesting topic, kind of from a, from a historical part of my career. I'm very interested in hearing people's perspectives as we talk about the current workforce dynamic. Um, we have a really great roundtable um, uh, today, and so I thought I would just um, acknowledge everyone who's here and then maybe we can go around and everyone can just introduce themselves briefly. We have uh, Dr. Christina Banks, who is the Director of Interdisciplinary Center for the Healthy Workplaces here at UC Berkeley. Scott Phillips, the Senior Director of Global Workforce Solutions at Salesforce. Sunita Parbu, who is the Head of Product at CVK, which is a COVID app for reopening safely. Dr. Tara Behrend, uh, Program Director Science of Organizations at the National Science Foundation, and Wayne Crosby, co-founder of Humu, which addresses employee resilience and mental health. So maybe we can just start um, with you, Christina, and then go around uh, and share just a little bit about your background and kind of the pieces that you bring into the conversation for today. Sure, thanks, Stacey, and uh, I'm happy to be part of this panel. Uh, I am an industrial organizational psychologist who's had a lengthy career in both academics and as a practitioner, uh, currently leading this uh, Healthy Workplaces Center and also uh, a senior lecturer at the Haas School of Business. So it's a unique combination where I'm uh, bringing uh, my experience uh, with uh, the experience of uh, a, a lot of different experts from different fields to come together and figure out how to create healthy workplaces. Great, thank you for joining us. And uh, Scott. Sure, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Um, Scott Phillips, I'm a senior director uh, in our workplace solutions group. And, and effectively what we're involved in with Salesforce is looking at the workplace, uh, looking at our occupancy planning, uh, looking at our workplace strategy, and you know, this is uh, obviously something that we're addressing on a day-to-day -day basis as we reopen offices safely, 
uh, as we look to the future of what uh, those offices uh, will need to support. We have 160 global offices uh, around the world supporting about 8 million square feet. So uh, it's definitely top of mind for, for our team. Fabulous. Uh, Sunita. Hi everyone, I'm here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I uh, come from a background of building software products. I've been building software products for about 20 years. A couple of them have been related to employment and the future of work. One of them was a large enterprise product for managing employees and the other one was a labor marketplace for blue collar workers. Uh, I've been following the future of work trends primarily as a way to understand how technology solutions can, can help us and help, you know, help a large number of workers to find what they're looking for. Uh, right now, I am volunteering at CV Key Project and we're a <clears throat> nonprofit that is an assembly of technologists and healthcare people who are building software to help reopen re responsibly and try and get the economy working again. And one of the big areas that we're focused on is doing this in a privacy focused way so that everybody feels comfortable with this. Thanks. Glad to be here. And uh, Dr. Tara Barand. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so I am, like Christina, an industrial organizational psychology researcher. I'm at Purdue University in the psychology department most of the time. Uh, my research there has to do with how people sort of react to technology in the workplace. So how do they react to surveillance? How do they use technology to learn, to collaborate, to have meetings? Uh, right now, I'm also a program director at the National Science Foundation, where I manage the Science of Organizations program. Um, I also contribute to the, the Future of Work at the Human Technology Frontier program, which is a mouthful, and their i program, which um, is quite similar to uh, the center in terms of its model. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, Wayne. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Um, so I'm a co-founder of Humu. We started about three years ago, and we focus on um, how can we use small interventions um, at the intersection of understanding behavior, technology, uh, and work, and bring that all together in order to make a better workplace for everybody um, to help achieve their goals, the organization goals, um, and, and really target, you know, what, are you, what, what could you be working on right now that would best help you succeed. Um, and, and we've been, like I said, uh, at it for about three years and, and um, hopeful that, that uh, we can continue to, to improve work by bringing some state-of-the-art technology and science into that workplace to, to help employees. Well, I suspect when you started, you would, could have never imagined that you'd be um, uh, sort of building solutions in one of the most disruptive and um, interesting times uh, for, yeah. and, and sort of uh, evolutionary times for the hu human workforce. Um, well, I wanted to just uh, remind folks who are listening and our, our um, roundtable participants that this is really um, intended as a roundtable, not necessarily a panel. So um, we're going to have a wide ranging conversation and feel free to pose questions and or speak directly to each other on the roundtable as we're really trying at UC Berkeley to get the benefit of your, your knowledge and also to share that with the audience that's, that's listening. So, but I will as moderator kick it off. So, I mean, we all, we all have been grappling with the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen very large organizations that have pretty much overnight changed um, to completely remote workforces. We're seeing small businesses like restaurants and others that um, have had to really make major adjustments in order to stay even stay in business and how they uh, deal with their employees and, and, um, and overall manage and, and keep their workforce safe and secure. So I guess my, my just overarching question to sort of kick things off is, will remote work continue to be the standard after the global pandemic recedes? Is this a fundamental shift that we're seeing in the workforce or a temporary one? Um, what is your perspective on how this um, changes things going forward? And let me actually, why don't I point to Wayne first um, in this one? Oh, I was going to say, like, Scott, this is right up your alley, right? This is, you're living and breathing this every day and making real decisions on, on how that, I think, from, from my perspective, that the, uh, the, the workplace isn't going away, um, and lo like, long term. There will always be some amount of... of um, 
benefit from having those serendipitous conversations that happen in the hallways. Um, I do think it's, it is fundamentally changing though. And I think that you will see companies uh, recognize that they are able to perform and do well and succeed in a remote work environment. And a lot of those kind of more traditional values associated with like everybody has to be in the office are breaking down and we're starting to see that that's okay. We're as an, as, as uh, technology has advanced over the last decade, we have the tools and the mechanisms to be able to actually succeed in a more remote environment. Um, but it still doesn't satisfy, you know, kind of that core of, of, of uh, I think what you're seeing is, is a lot of people still trying to grapple with how do I handle the innovation piece that happens serendipitously in that office. Uh, and as a result, I don't think that, uh, the, that the office is, is like doomed forever. Um, we're communal creatures and we like to be together. So I think that, that you want to create those spaces and, and those opportunities to happen. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Wayne. I think uh, his response brought up two unrelated issues. The first one is what kinds of work can be done remotely versus not remotely. The other issue though is what do human beings need um, to feel sort of psychologically fulfilled? And I think we're all feeling quite a bit of angst being away from our coworkers. So maybe we can solve the remote work part, um, but not the human need part. Or maybe we can solve the human need part, but not the work part. Uh, and, and I guess I just don't know. But I do think it's important to talk about those issues separately. Yeah, that's, that's great, Tara and Wayne. You know, talking about human needs, uh, it's not talked about very often. It's more like, how can we engineer a solution to this so that we can get people back to work uh, in a safe environment? But what's really missing is the social cohesion uh, among people, which has implications for what the company culture is. And I'll just throw in there that uh, Gen X, Gen Zs, uh, millennials, uh, they want to be together. And so I think a fundamental question that has to be asked is, uh, is there an alternative to social distancing? Is there an op opportunity for us to work in close proximity, but safely? I, I just don't see a lot of effort going in that direction, but I think it's gonna be necessary now and, and going forward. And it's not just about, you know, the soft and fuzzy side of caring about people. If, if people need something and it's not being, fulfilled that becomes a competitive advantage for the company that can offer it, um, or it becomes a source of um, kind of, you know, dissatisfaction that contribute to all kinds of negative outcomes. So you should care for yourself in addition to caring for the people who are part of your organization. Yeah, just to, to talk a little bit about the workplace journey that Salesforce has been on over the last several months, as we think about even, even pre- uh, COVID, we were looking at you know, how do we enhance the employee experience? How do we create more choice around uh, where and how people work? And so, you know, moving into the the pandemic issues, then you know, it certainly elevated that discussion and required us to uh, think even more quickly about that. And and uh, you know, to 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 look at changes that may have taken uh, a number of years to occur. Uh, so, you know, we look back the initial phases of, you know, the, the work from home efforts, you know, once people kind of got their feet under them and understood, you know, how this is going to work, that this was going to be an extended period, you know, we really started to think in terms of, you know, we, we may see more, uh, you know, significant increases in work from home. And uh, we, we already had a remote work program uh, that accounted for, you know, generally a smaller percentage of our employee base. Uh, but the initial thinking was that we we may see that grow by 10, 20, 30 percent. And then, you know, as we've come through this journey, I think what we're learning is that, you know, and, and the feedback from our employees is also telling us that, you know, they want the flexibility, they want that choice. Uh, goes back to what we were looking at even pre-COVID. Uh, they, they want the choice to be able to make those decisions. And so we're seeing a, really a move toward more flexibility, more choice, and including more intention about whether I'm coming to the office, when I need to come to the office, and what am I going to, going to come to the workplace for? And so that's been a lot of our focus around uh, the future planning. I would love to hear more about how we can use uh, the current technology and emerging technology to connect people better when they're uh, working remotely, because I just see that as a uh, a, a huge problem for people uh, trying to be productive 
uh, back to Tara's point, what kind of work are we doing? And, and working remotely is well suited for certain kinds of work, but not for others, and certainly not for innovation, um, because we need to have accidental uh, uh, bump into's with people who are very different from ourselves. Uh, the, uh, the analogy of the water cooler, but some people don't even know what that means. But uh, it, it's just so important that we figure out how to harness technology in a new way, like virtual reality or uh, augmented reality, um, so that we can create a space where people can meet and interact socially, downtime, and have communications that would have happened in the workplace. I'm just wondering, what, what do you know that might actually facilitate that? Uh, some people here might remember Second Life and uh, you know, it, it had a, a, <laughs> a quick rise and a quick fall, but there is something to the idea of feeling like you're sharing a physical space with somebody that really facilitates trust and interaction. And I'm, I'm wondering if Second Life will see a resurgence, maybe not exactly like that, but something that's virtual reality enabled. Um, the technology is there and it has a lot to do with just what kinds of norms we set for what's expected. You know, leaders have a huge role to play here by setting norms about is it okay to stay on the Zoom call for 10 minutes afterwards and you know shoot the breeze? Or, or is everyone supposed to convey that they're very busy and have to rush off to the next meeting? Right? What does the leader set in place in terms of expected behaviors? I'm curious, Wayne, are you, you're, you're out there providing technologies and other solutions to companies. Uh, what are the things that are, are sort of most uh, in demand right now in terms of um, both meeting the needs you talked about earlier uh, and others have talked about how do we how do we meet the the new needs of the new workforce um, and also just technology for con the convening and the togetherness yeah it's really interesting because um, I agree that there's still a huge um, uh, evolution in terms of technology in terms of what we need to do but what we're actually seeing with uh, people who are able to be successful in, in the environments in which are creating successful remote workers, um, there's really four elements to it that are emerging. And it's, you know, personal flexibility, allowing people to, you know, um, there's a lot of pressure and stress around, you know, what what's going on with the family and the kids and, and supporting um, uh, parents along that. And, and the, the dynamics that that creates in a team are certainly challenging as well. And so, um, creating an environment that is that is also empathetic. Um, that's the second one of being able to understand what people's needs actually are. Um, there's a whole phase that's happening right now with regards to establishing new norms um, and being clear about what those norms are. To uh, the terrorist point about like, does it can you stay late in meetings? What are the norms that, and and how do we start meetings on time? Do we do we actually you know? Do we need time between meetings? All of that stuff, all of those things need to, to crystallize and we need to have clear norms associated with that. And the last thing that we're seeing is really, um, isn't technology related at all. It's, it's about having an emotional support system and, and being able to show up and be present for people. And this, is, this has been a continuing theme con, you know, for all successful leaders of, of just being able to be present for conversations. Um, and technology, in some ways, makes that harder. Um, sometimes it makes it easier, right? Because you can do asynchronous conversations in a way that you can still be there for people, um, even if you you aren't there in person. Um, but you need to be able to create those spaces for those emo emotional connections. Um, and and I think those are the those are the areas that we've seen emerge as uh, as we continue to work in remote environments. And, and people who figure those out, they tend to do very well. Um, and those that don't, they have these like really strong friction points along the journey um, and, and big challenges associated with it. I wanted to call out a comment in the chat about fatigue because I think it relates to Wayne's point as well. And, you know, I think another source of fatigue is, is trying to switch between all these technologies that exist and knowing which one is the right one for a particular purpose. I mean, in my workplace, we have uh, probably at least a dozen if, I, if we have a, you know, a, a Skype for business and we have chats and we have emails and we have Outlook and we have Cisco and we have, right, I can, I can keep going and, and it isn't clear why each one is different or what each one does differently. And so communicating that is so important. I'm not suggesting to consolidate, um, but I am suggesting that this is part of the norm setting that needs to happen. 
uh, different technologies convey different amounts and different richnesses of information, right? Like an email has the problem of silence. If I send you an email and you don't respond, I don't know what that means. I don't know if it means you're mad at me or if you didn't see the email or if you forwarded it to someone else, right? And I can't resolve that ambiguity. And that is a source of stress and fatigue. So um, maybe I should use um, a technology that shows me when you've seen it and shows me that you're typing with a little indicator. Um, these are all skills that take a long time to learn. And what you're touching on, uh, Tara, is, is uh, how to combat the fatigue. Uh, we don't have many um, tools that we give permission to use, people for people to use, in order to have restorative moments uh, during the day. Um, and technology can happen there as well, it, you know, to create places that uh, employees can go to hang out, uh, where it might be, uh, and I'm making this up, uh, it might be a forest or it might be a meadow or it might be a beach or something like that because we know it has restorative effects. And I'm, I just want to uh, emphasize the importance of paying attention to the health and well being of people both working on site and remotely, but it's more of a struggle remotely because people have multiple responsibilities and they do a lot of juggling during the day. The reason why health and well-being is so important is that it is the pathway to productivity. Um, and uh, we, that's an underappreciated um, uh, scientific finding. Uh, lots of data to back that up. And uh, we know that uh, productivity and life satisfaction comes from need satisfaction. So we so need satisfaction leads to health and well-being leads to productivity. It's, it's uh, sort of a straightforward model, but, it, but health and well-being, I think, is uh, getting a little bit uh, short shrift uh, these days uh, with a singular emphasis on safety, which is an important need. So another, there's another comment in the chat about culture, and I think we've been touching on this. I mean, the notion of needs, the notion of of mental health and, and rejuvenation. Um, what, what do we actually think, in, in addition to technology, what, what do companies need to do in order to build real culture in this new distributed environment? So it's not just that we're, you know, we're working in offices around the world, but now we're working from, you know, myriad homes. And, and so, so given the challenges we've been touching on, what, what are the best practices or the the tools that companies can use to help build culture in this new world? Well, I'll raise leadership again. And, and we've known for almost a century that the good leaders do two kinds of things. One thing they do is make it really clear what people are supposed to be doing, right? So they set goals and they give feedback on those goals. Um, the other thing they do is show consideration and caring for the people that are there and treat them as full human beings, which means being understanding when they need to be flexible in their work schedules and um, sort of just generally being supportive of what, whatever their goals are. Uh, that doesn't change because we're talking about a new work environment. Those two fundamental sets of behaviors still matter a lot. Um, and then I'd add too about norm setting that um, if I tell everybody it's okay if you work from home, but I'm in the office every single day, I'm sending a message that, sure, you can work from home, but I'd prefer that you were here, right? So I need to change my behavior in order to show that any sort of work schedule is, is allowed. And so I set a lot of norms just by behaving as a leader. Um, and, I, and I think that's really, um, really critical. Yeah, and a uh, follow-up to that is setting those norms, uh, setting those values, and leading has to be communicated effectively and frequently and in a sincere way and then measured uh, so that there's some accountability to leadership that they're actually following through with what they say they value. Um, I think uh, we really need to uh, put the pedal to the metal when it comes to uh, leaderships communicating to all employees um, on these issues to develop that culture. Because uh, when you have a distributed uh, workforce and, uh, across time zones and, and in different places from home and working in lots of different places, we've got to knit them together somehow. And that is a leadership role. I'm thinking about additional things like 
training and onboarding. There, there are employees in the workforce right now that have never been to the office to even <laughs> feel the culture of a company and things like career progression. How do we actually think about advancement and so, so many aspects of the, the sort of overarching sort of satisfaction of an employee in this, in this new realm. So I don't know if um, I was going to add to that, that piece of it. So, so up until this crisis, there has been remote work going on. And in a lot of ways, it was a little bit under the radar and people who were doing equivalent work, but remotely were somewhat second class citizens. Right, that the processes that the organization had to help people align, you know, how, does, how is what I'm doing a part of the bigger picture, right? How is what I'm doing important? Is it um, impactful? Uh, all of those things were really not geared to suit the person that was remote. And, you know, a lot less clarity on achievement and getting promoted and demonstrating success. But many people were doing those jobs mainly because remote was really the only option that they had. Either they were just physically not near a job center, a place of work, or you know, because of other you know, family commitments. And I think what this pandemic is causing us to do is since everyone has been required to work from home, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, there's been people who have like made makeshift Zoom calls in their closet. This is the only place they can get away from their kids. And, uh, you know, and we're realizing that, huh, we do need processes for everyone to be able to participate, to engage, and to be evaluated and rewarded for what they do. And, you know, how do we make decisions? If you miss the Zoom call, like, do you not get to be part of that decision? And like, so I see a lot of companies now thinking about those questions but what are the you know what's the cadence of work where we're going to decide what we're working on we're going to make decisions we're going to do brainstorming and discovery so even though um even though we've been doing remote for a while i think this has made it much clearer to to leaders that uh that these sort of softer aspects of of involving people and we've had these issues before right introverts and ex extroverts how do you, when you do a roundtable discussion, make sure every, everybody has a say, my AirPod just fell out. Um, you know, how do you make sure that you get those diverse opinions? And I feel like the conversations we're having right now are really valuable and that there's a lot more input from teams and from individuals about how things are going for them. I'm not sure, you know, five years ago or even one year ago, whether an individual who was working remotely was really that comfortable talking to their manager or to the CEO and saying, it's not really working for me. I bet I could be twice as effective and twice as productive if we did X, Y, or Z. But I hear a lot more of those conversations happening now. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, and something that we've been really, uh, really trying to work through is, you know, the equity of participation, the equity of access to leadership, the equity to, you know, being able to uh, you know, find uh, development opportunities, you know, all of those things are somewhat equal when we're all uh, working remotely. But when we start to bring people back to the office, you know, how do we maintain that equity? And I think, you know, they're, you know, looking at technology, looking at uh, process looking at leadership to ensure that access is available. You know, I think all of those things are are part of the consideration as it relates to workplace and, and maintaining that equity as we do have folks that are starting to come back to the office. I'm glad you mentioned equity, Scott, and this also relates to a comment in the chat about what kinds of jobs are going remote. And this obviously um, brings up issues of um, socioeconomic class differences, right? White collar jobs are remote, not all jobs are remote. And we need to be very careful about how we talk about that. Um, and when you see people coming back to the office, it's typically um, not equal either, right? So being able to continue working from home turns out to be a luxury. Uh, and so you're introducing another class difference into a workplace that might have already had sensitivities related to class differences. That's going to create all kinds of problems and is also just unjust, right, on its, on its face. Um, and so I, I think thinking about who has the privilege of working from home is, is critical here and how do you make that decision? Um, I also wanted to come back to Sunita's earlier point about um, 
the fact that historically people who worked remotely were sort of invisible. And I think that is true. Part of the reason is that many managers um, wanted to manage by seeing what a person was doing all day, right? Like how many hours are you physically in your seat? How many words did you type? Um, and then as work evolved, that no longer became the right metric for how useful you are or what you're producing. And so the, the shift is from process, like what are you doing to what did you produce? What is the output? It's really hard for people because it's just so tempting to say, well, gosh, this person worked really hard, right? They, they did the best because they worked really hard. Um, but for, for most jobs, that, that isn't all that's important. And that's the mental shift that has to happen. Yeah, I completely agree. I think a um, couple of notes on that. I think that uh, we're hearing from managers, they're saying that they feel like they lost one of their senses, right? And, and it's actually tied to this because the norms are around, you know, being able to experience, you know, what is work like um, and not having that, that physical shared space uh, really does feel like you're, you've lost something. Um, but I'm not convinced that that's a... Uh, the, the thing that you lost is actually of, um, to your point of, of the thing that we should be measuring, right? We, we, we really need to be looking at what is the productivity of people? Um, how can we meet them where they are in terms of their family needs um, and, and still be able to do great work and, and move things forward? Um, I think that there's like some, some very small shifts that people can make. Um, and anybody who's been through, you know, taking a team from uh, all on one site to splitting it across multiple sites or around the world has kind of experienced this at a, at a micro level. Um, and we're experiencing it. We're about ready to experience it as we re-enter the workforce at a very big scale. Um, and all of those lessons learned in terms of how do you communicate with people who uh, are not in your physical space? Those are lessons that we needed to, to really bring into the work environment and systematize and actually build tools around um, and, and facilitate that. Um, so I think we're, we're on that journey and we have been for many years uh, and we're going to see a huge acceleration over that over the next uh, couple of months. Yeah. I mean, one problem is that it requires more structure. Everyone has to have a little bit more structure in terms of what their job is and is not. And I think many, many sort of knowledge workers are uncomfortable with that idea, right? They like to think that no one has a job title here and we all just contribute to the mission. Um, but that doesn't work. I mean, if you imagine a team of astronauts saying like, whatever, like you're all just astronauts, it's not going to work, right? You have to have a specific duty that is your duty and you have to communicate that really clearly. And everyone on the team has to know what everyone else's job is, right? So we have to have mutual knowledge of each other. And that extra structure, I think, does make some people very uncomfortable, but it's absolutely necessary. I wanted to also bring up this, uh, the topic of returning to the, to the office. And I mean, we, we've been talking about kind of the higher order needs, but the safety, safety, security, feeling like folks are trusting that it's the right time to come back, that they're coming back to a place that they can work in effectively and, and stay, you know, stay healthy. Um, all of those are very real issues um, as well. And so I know a number of you are working on those topics. I'd be curious to hear, again, what you think are best practices or what are the most um, effective companies doing in this regard. Um, to evaluate both timing and, and safety and health concerns. Well, I can uh, kick it off by saying that uh, there, there seems to be a great deal of consensus now in terms of the physical attributes of the workplace um, that's really being spearheaded by large real estate uh, organizations that have lots of uh, space that they lease um, and uh, because they have to solve the problem, how can we get people back into their spaces? And so you are seeing things, uh, well, primarily density issues. Uh, prior to COVID, uh, we packed people in as much as possible uh, in order to have a smaller real estate footprint, uh, which saves money, which means that the money can go to other things. Um, but, Density is one thing uh, which has turned into spacing of desks and one-way walkways and um, a queuing system for picking up lunches or picking up beverages, um, a lot of hand washing and hand sanitizing. But what's really interesting is that it is an engineering approach to solving the problem of safety and uh, having a, uh, a workplace that 
uh, people feel is safe and therefore comfortable in. Uh, but I, and <laughs> even to the point where you've got to smell Clorox or Pine Sol um, in the environment so everybody's convinced, oh, it's been cleaned. Um, but uh, I'm getting reports from young people uh, going back to organizations that uh, sometimes these uh, rules are followed and sometimes they're not. So the question really is how good are the rules and how safe is safe if uh, people bend over the plexiglass to talk to the person next to them or walk both ways on a one-way walkway or never sanitize their hands or don't put on their mask or they remove their mask, don't put it back on. So the engineering approach is kind of leading the change, but what really needs to be done is to figure out um, how can changes be made that are compatible with human nature, with how human behavior actually works. And uh, with these violations, because people will always take the shortest path to their desk, and people will always uh, go to get something to eat when they're hungry, and et cetera. I don't think we've got it mastered. I would completely agree with that. You know, the you know the way this virus spreads is really a function of density, duration of contact, and ventilation. And for you know, some organizations have the luxury to be able to play with those factors, that they can have different shifts of people come to work on <clears throat> different days. Uh, but there are just settings, especially in the blue collar economy, where that's not even possible, that people need to show up at work to earn, a, earn their income and pay their rent. And so regardless of the fact that the conditions are not safe, those folks are gonna be coming to work regardless, and they're not going to, I mean, they will, be fearful, but they will still come. And so to me, that's actually one of the, one of the challenges we have as a country, which is you know, the pockets of spread that we have, those are in the community and we need to do more to ensure not just you know, the Salesforce office, which I'm sure is kitted out beautifully in readiness for people to come back to work. And you know, that, that this is actually happening in other places as well. Uh, you know, schools are another example. There are schools that have the facilities and the buildings to spread students out. And there are others that were already under-resourced where there's really no way that they're going to solve the problem. They're just gonna reopen and have teachers and students come back pretty much the way they were. With what we're doing at CV Key, there's a sort of securing the border problem, which is we're all coming into this environment. Let us do checks at the border, you know, the temperature checking, the symptom checking and so forth. And a lot of people agree with that notion, right? Meaning if I'm not well in some way, or if I've traveled to one of these hotspots, I shouldn't be going to work. I shouldn't be going here and there, but it really comes back down to human nature. We, we all know those stories of, you know, why is it that all the kids get sick suddenly at lunchtime at school? It's because the Tylenol that their parents gave them in the morning just wore off and they're suddenly feeling very crummy. And so when, you know, that is, that is a big part of the problem, which is an individual personally may not feel like they're really doing something that's outrageous and they're, you know, they, they may be asymptomatic and, or they may just be like, oh, I kind of have a headache, but let me wait and see, I'll go to work anyway. So those are, those are I think, the real challenges that we have in terms, of, in terms of trying to secure, secure the workplace itself. If without that change in behavior, it's really around, you know, keeping people away from each other, right, and, and reducing the density and the times of exposure. I would really like to see how we can bring people back to the workplace uh, so that they can, at some point in the day, able to interact normally because it's gonna happen anyway. And um, I'm playing with this idea of safety bubbles, creating safety bubbles at work. Uh, Scott knows about it because we've, we've talked about it in uh, offline in a discussion group, but uh, it, safety bubbles are already created 
Um, we're used to them in our families, in our uh, small social groups. That's where we take a pledge, explicit or implicit, which says, uh, I'm going to keep you safe by every time I exit this bubble, I am going to wear all the protective gear and I'm going to follow all of the guidelines. The, the, the advantage of having a safety bubble is that when you're with the people who are part of your safety bubble, you can act normally. You don't, you don't have to socially distance. You don't have to hand wash compulsively and, and so on. Um, how can we apply that concept to the workplace so that maybe a team of people can make uh, a pledge to each other to keep each other safe when they're outside the workplace so that they can then meet periodically and interact in the manner that's natural. Uh, I've thought about this in terms of schools and uh, really what's, what, where it breaks down is uh, people thinking humans are imperfect, <laughs> they're gonna blow it. And so there has to be a way of uh, dealing with uh, people who do blow it and, and expose, potentially expose folks in the bubble um, to uh, contamination. But we already have protocols for that, which is we have people identify when they have not masked up, when they've uh, been with people who are sick and so on, and we quarantine them. So I'm hoping we can get to a place where we, we can work normally under restricted circumstances. Scott, are, you, are these things you're implementing or any, any additional <laughs> things you wanna share on that? Yeah, you know, as I as I listen to Christina and, and as we have talked in the past, you know, the big um, the big component uh, that is required from a safety standpoint is trust, and you know that that has to be from a workplace standpoint, it has to be a value uh, that is built into the culture, and uh, and so you know how do you how do you build that trust from a leadership standpoint, from a peer to peer standpoint. You know, and uh, you know, it's, it's trust for health and well-being. It's trust for you know, uh, my my career development. It's trust for you know all of these different areas, um, in, including if we're we're going to extend this notion of bubbles and, and safety from a from a health standpoint. And so, you know, I think that's an area where uh, Salesforce uh, we've continued to highlight that as a you know a um, a critical value. Uh, in the company and from a cultural standpoint and ensuring that when we are uh, putting things in place, whether it's workplace or, or other initiatives, that trust is at the, the top of the list of considerations when we're, when we're doing that. Great. So I have um, the last question that I'd like to kind of go around and have folks share on, but Iklak, like I wanted to check in with you if you had any more at the end of our session or if we can sort of go right up to the end of the hour. Um, I think you can go to the end of the hour, but somehow if you can maybe let everyone at least put in two words about, you know, you know, what does this mean for what Berkeley should be doing or, you know, something along those lines. I definitely, you know, got all of the ideas. I could probably spend five minutes telling you that I got all those ideas, but I will not. Um, I'll let you, you carry on, but let, let me try to get the other kind of feedback too. Great. Well, I can incorporate that into my last question. So I, I'm, you know, whenever there's disruption, I'm always most interested in what are the opportunities that arise from this. So it's been a tough year. It's been, you know, very challenging on a lot of levels for almost everyone. Um, certainly for employees, certainly for companies. I mean, the whole workforce question is is one where a lot of our norms are thrown up the air. We're trying to just create, you know, as you mentioned, norms that that work for folks. That's pretty fundamental. But I'm curious. What are the things that get you excited? What are you seeing as opportunities? And if in that there is also an opportunity for Berkeley or an area where you think we should be studying or, or looking at it as sort of a key theme out of coming out of this uh, situation as we move forward into the, the coming year, um, I would love to hear that as well. So the, the thing I've been thinking about a lot and I would love to see Berkeley help with this is this notion of collision. So a lot of entrepreneurship is around these happy collisions, 
you know, the, the, you know, somebody like me sitting down with like Tara and Christina and, you know, all of the depth of their knowledge and research and using that to like, we could build software for that, right? These collisions and, you know, we, we might've not met each other, you know, otherwise, but so I feel like remote and Zoom is making it easier for us to have these collisions. It's, you know, on the, you know, as I was reading about students going back to college and applying for college, there are now students who are able to tour colleges who couldn't before because the colleges are now making it much easier to virtually visit them. And, uh, and so this is, you know, applying to the middle of the curve where they didn't have the budget or the time or the resources to go visit a number of colleges. So I feel like information can move more freely and these collisions can be uh, much more sort of productive and maybe just lead to, you know, outbreak, you know, outbreak decisions and ideas. And I imagine that there's a whole body of work about how do you, how do you make collisions more successful? I think that there's, there's been bodies of work around creativity and brainstorming and how do you do it the Pixar way and these kinds of things. I feel like there's going to be a real meaty body of work around how do you get, you know, random people together on zoom calls and how do you start the call and do you get people to tell jokes or whatever it is uh we're all making it up but i would love to see some research-based sort of gotchas on how to do that i love that idea i, I just want to jump in just say thank you for that because we are thinking about topics in that direction so you're reinforcing something that um it's really helpful to hear Go ahead, Tara. Great. Oh, yeah. And I'll just second that as well. I think uh, this is the kind of problem that requires multidisciplinary collaboration, right? So nobody can fix it on their own. And any, any sort of technological tool that can be built to facilitate that is great, but it also is a mindset shift, right? That nobody has a sort of sole claim to this problem and, and we should be a bit humble and open-minded in terms of how we approach it. I think that's, that's exactly the right approach. Um, these tools that we build to, to help people sort of socialize and get information, um, we build them for COVID now, but they end up being really valuable in the long term. And I, I really appreciate Sunita's point about kids being able to visit colleges they never could before. Now, if you're the kind of person who has to work from home because of family obligations, now you're not, you know, at a disadvantage anymore. I think it's, it's exactly the right idea. Um, I would say that like uh, changing a little bit is like this has been a huge crisis right for us for everybody in the world um, you know Winston Churchill had it right like never waste a good crisis this is not going to be the last crisis we have and every time that one of these things happen it's an opportunity to actually um, understand how we're going to navigate it quickly how we're going to reset norms how we're going to come back together um, and I think that there's going to like these are going to, unfortunately, I think, increase in frequency, and it's going to be, we're going to continue to have, uh, you know, a, a fairly periodic set of crises that emerge, and starting to think through how do we actually, um, what are the behaviors that we want people to exhibit as we kind of navigate these, and how, how do we think through them and, and make sure that we're navigating them in a successful way so that we don't spend nine months in quarantine in the future that we actually can can put together and say like oh okay we we've seen this before this is how we're actually going to navigate this these are the personality traits that tend to emerge these are the ones that actually tend to be successful in these environments um and then here's how we reinforce them in order to get the behaviors to emerge that are going to be able to to set us up for success as we navigate them um i just it's going to happen over and over again and so anything we can do to start laying the foundation for research on you know how, how do we uh, start to, to navigate these things in a more predictable and consistent way, I think is a, is a really great area for, for investment. Yeah. yeah, I think about the, you know, the huge opportunities here around uh, thinking about uh, distributed work and distributed teams and, you know, for Salesforce, the ability to draw upon talent in areas that we may have never had access to before and uh, you know, and how we put uh, not only workplace uh, technology, how we put process, uh, how we put leadership in place uh, to best uh, manage in a distributed environment like that. Um, you know, some of the equity issues that uh, that we touched on, 
you know, I think there's a huge, uh, huge opportunity to explore that further. And I'll uh, capitalize on uh, much of what everybody said uh, uh, because there are great ideas and a uh, couple of things. Uh, you know, before COVID, uh, healthy workplaces uh, were uh, sort of seen as a luxury and uh, got translated into a wellness program that HR administered or, you know, a couple of things uh, happening. But we need to bring the best of what we have learned about healthy workplaces forward into the workplaces of the future because they will become a non-monetary benefit to offer employees, which will directly translate into competitive advantage. Um, I think uh, people have learned from commuting, I don't like it. Uh, and so another parallel idea is that uh, we should be thinking more creatively about uh, where work can happen and the, the use of co-working space and um, even, you know, I'll, I'll throw it in there, perhaps mobile lounges that go around neighborhoods and pick up people uh, who, from a company to get together and do some uh, innovative thinking and getting to know each other. Let's, let's take the boundaries off of the notion of how we work, where we work, when we work, and just see what we come up with because uh, we do have an opportunity for a fresh start. And I would love to work on that. Fabulous. Well, I thank you all to the panelists. I click, I don't know if you have any wrap up comments or questions, but I'm just very appreciative of everyone taking their time to be with us today and to both benefit those who've tuned in as well as the center in terms of feeding us your ideas and, and thoughts and uh, sort of uh, looking forward into the opportunities of the future and how we can all be part of making the future of work something that works for everyone. All right, perfect. Um, so it's uh, we're we're right on one o'clock or, or just a minute after. My only wrap up comment is this has been a great discussion. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, as Stacy says, also on behalf of the center, we can make use of this, this input. Uh, so thank you, and um, I'm looking forward to staying in touch with everyone as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Great comments in the All chat right. too. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.